Okay, good morning. Thank you all for attending. Uh, very happy to have Kevin Gallagher back with us. Kevin is a NASA Solar System Ambassador, and he's maintained an interest in astronomy and space exploration since he was a child during the Gemini and later Apollo missions. He has served as both Vice President and President of his local astronomy club in New Jersey. Kevin's educational background includes a BS in chemical engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology, a certificate in financial controls from New York University, and the senior executive program of the London Business School. Today, he'll be talking about the Mars Perseverance rover. Please welcome Kevin Gallagher. Thank you, Michael. That was a very kind uh, introduction. You did the long form, read, read the resume for me. Thank you. That, that was very kind. And again, thank you uh, for being such a great host and, and, and hosting, hosting these talks. And to our, our uh, audience, whether you're uh, watching us live or whether you're following us uh, maybe on a, a recorded version, welcome back. Um, I hope many of you were able to uh, be there for my presentations in the past when I've either talked about the search for alien life or I've talked about Mars. Today, a little different take on Mars. We're going to narrow down to a specific mission, very timely, very much in the news. Hopefully, you've been seeing news broadcasts about it. We're going to talk about the Mars Perseverance rover. Just as a reminder to everybody, um, what's a solar system ambassador? It's a volunteer program. Uh, from NASA, administered by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, at uh, Caltech, and uh, people like me who uh, have a lifelong interest in uh, things related to space and astronomy and space programs, uh, do talks for libraries and for school groups about, uh, about NASA programs and, and about space, and hopefully encourage STEM education, right? Science, technology, engineering, and, and math. And so you may recall that I've spoken in the past about whether or not it's possible to live on Mars and, and what some of those challenges might be. Um, I, I really love to, to do that with uh, school groups uh, because I tell them it's one of them who's going to go to Mars. It's, it's them, one of, one of their classmates that's going to help build the rockets or, or actually fly there. It's not me. Um, I'm way past it. We're, we're probably talking about mid-2030s is the next likely window to actually get people human exploration to, to go to Mars. So the kids get excited, and I like to think that they remember me because I, I tell them one of them's going to go. Right, so very much in the news. The Mars Perseverance rover uh, touchdown happened just, oh, I guess we're coming up on a couple of months now. Uh, on the surface of Mars, it's the, the brand new NASA rover. The color picture on the left is a, um, a simulation. The one on the right is an actual photo that was taken from one of the 14 cameras on the lander. And it kind of shows you that, that barren Martian landscape, uh, also the one behind me that we're kind of used to seeing now. In this case, it also shows the, the shadow of the rover. A little later on, hopefully if I can get it to work, we'll We'll watch the um, the actual footage of the rover rover coming down because it's a pretty exciting to think, thing to see. Just as a reminder about you know where we are and what we're talking about between the Earth and Mars. Let's take the big picture. Um, I sometimes refer to this as the the God's eye view of the Milky Way uh, galaxy, and our Sun is one of those tiny little white dots on the inner part of one of those spiral arms. Uh, the Milky Way is uh, what's known as a barred spiral galaxy. It's taken us about 500 years to, to figure that out. Not easy necessarily to tell what kind of galaxy you're in from inside. There's a lot of things going on. But when we look at the summer Milky Way, what we're looking at is we're looking towards the center of the galaxy, towards that central bar you see in the photo. When we're looking at the evening at the winter Milky Way, we're looking at the opposite direction. So we're still looking through some of those spiral arms, but we're looking outside the galaxy. And then the spots in between that, that aren't where the Milky Way, we're either looking above the plane of the galaxy, like directly out towards us or below the plane of the galaxy. And that's when comes our chance to see other galaxies. But again, our sun, one of those little tiny white dots. And so we understand now, um, 
It's got planets around it, like um, many of the stars, if not most of the stars we look at. Um, it has planets left over from the original disk from which the sun formed. I titled this The Planets Are Here, sort of, because this diagram is a compression um, in space of where the planets are, and it doesn't really reflect their distances from each other. And we, we could talk a little bit about particularly the Earth-Mars distance in just a second. Um, but you kind of see going out from the sun, we've got the rocky planets, uh, sometimes known as the terrestrial planets, Mercury, uh, Venus, us, then Mars, then we get to the asteroid belt, and then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and the objects out in what's called the, the Kuiper belt. Um, the reality is this diagram in real space would be stretched out. So Jupiter is five times as far away from the sun as the earth is. Saturn is nine and a half times as far away from the sun as the earth is. So in reality, these would be very much more stretched out, but this is a general diagram of where the planets are. You know, a good question, especially if you're somebody like me who has an interest in the night sky and what you can see in the night sky, reasonable question to ask, uh, is Mars where we can see it? And the reason that's a reasonable question, if I go back to this diagram, you can imagine these orbits are like concentric um, almost circles, although they're ellipses, around the sun. If a planet's on the other side of the sun, we're not going to be able to see it, right? So a reasonable question to ask is, uh, can we see it? The next question usually is whether or not it's an object for the evening sky or whether we have to wait till uh, just before the dawn. Uh, Mars is getting smaller, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it is in the evening sky. Um, it's near the constellation of Taurus, and those the, the V we see here, uh, those are the horns of the bull, uh, Taurus. The Pleiades is down here, the Seven Sisters, if you know them, and this is looking west about halfway up in the sky. And this is for Friday and Saturday night. So if you look Friday night, Mars will be above the crescent moon. If you look Saturday night, Mars will be below the crescent moon uh, and getting smaller. This is about 45 minutes after sunset. So we're talking somewhere around 8.35 um, or so in the, in the evening. So yes, you can see Mars, the reddish object there. Easy to get confused color-wise with Aldebaran, a very reddish, fairly bright star down here too. So that's why I showed Friday and Saturday night because it's kind of easier to tell where Mars is if you want to look up. Okay, <clears throat> I mentioned this idea of distance and relative distance from the sun. We tend to measure those for solar system objects in something called astronomical units or AU. And Mars is roughly one and a half AU or one and a half times further from the sun uh, than is the Earth. So you can see here the Earth to sun distance around 93 um, million mi miles and Mars more like 142. Okay, what is Mars? A little bit of a review. Terrestrial planet, the fourth and the last one before we get to the asteroid belt and we get to the gas giants. It orbits around the sun, as we saw, just like the Earth, a bit farther away, which is part of the reason why it's a colder place. There is ice, um, as you can see in the, the photographs here uh, to, the, to the side. There, there are polar uh, caps on, on Mars, both a, a north polar cap and a south polar cap. There is ice on Mars, both water ice and dry ice, meaning uh, solid carbon dioxide. <clears throat> There's a question about the liquid water, and we'll talk more about that because this idea of looking for liquid water or looking for where liquid water was is a really important driving force to the science behind these planetary missions. And certainly, if there is liquid water on Mars, it's not on the surface. It, there may be underground. Uh, it could be locked away in, in the form of combined with other uh, minerals as part of clays or something within the Martian surface, but it's not on the surface, although it looks like it was. Um, Mars is tilted. The photograph here doesn't show it, but it, so it has seasons just like the, the Earth does, what makes it interesting. A Martian day, just by accident, uh, is almost the same length as an Earth day. It's 37 minutes longer. That has some consequences for the folks at NASA who 
program the rovers and, and watch over Mars and that after a while, that half an hour difference is enough to make them live on a very different schedule. And essentially, you know, sometimes they're on the, the night shift in the, in the middle of the night looking, looking after this equipment. A Martian year, because it's further from the sun than we are, and a year is defined in how long it takes us to make a complete orbit around the sun, is about twice uh, the, the Earth year, 687 Earth days to be exact. And it's a very cold and dry place today. Um, we try and get a feel for the size of Mars compared to that of Earth. It's about half the size of Earth. Uh, again, a nice sort of reference point is if you think about our moon, uh, our moon is, would be about half again the, the, size of, uh, the size of Mars. So <clears throat> far away, at its closest approach, it's about 40 million miles. And just for um, some reference, when we think about that in the context of going to the moon, and particularly in the context of the Apollo missions or other kinds of explorations on the moon, the moon is a quarter of a million miles away. So Mars is 160 times further away than is the moon. Now that's kind of a daunting number when it comes to the idea of sending probes there, especially sending human beings there and getting them back. It's a very cold place. The average temperature is somewhere around 81 degrees uh, below zero Fahrenheit. I mentioned this before, there, there's no liquid surface water today. There's essentially no moisture in the atmosphere, what there is of it on Mars, but there is plenty of evidence. And in fact, it's evidence that can't be described in any other easy way that it was once a water world. Uh, and had a significant amount of flowing water on it. I mentioned the, the idea of there's not much of a, a Martian atmosphere. So um, it's less than 1% of Earth's atmosphere. So it's very, very thin. It would be the equivalent of the, um, in terms of thickness, it would be equivalent to Earth's atmosphere at 100,000 feet, which is well higher than airplanes fly. Airplanes fly around 35,000, 38,000 feet. Uh, that requires uh, pressurized cabins and oxygen at 100,000 uh, feet above the earth. There's only 1% of the, the sea level atmosphere. So it is both a very thin atmosphere, which has all kinds of consequences to it. And what there is of it is not oxygen like ours or the combination of nitrogen and oxygen like ours it's mostly carbon dioxide. So it's, it's not air in the strictest sense. Another um, important aspect about Mars, whether it's with equipment or whether it's the idea or challenge of sending human beings there, it, is that there is no protective magnetosphere. And you may have heard of something called the Van Allen radiation belts. Uh, you probably have heard of something called the Aurora uh, Borealis. Um, this is where, the magnetic field around the Earth, the magnetosphere, channels particles, charged particles from outside of us around into the poles and really protects us from the most energetic and most damaging radiation from the sun. So the fact that there isn't this protection at Mars is important and significant as we go forward and we think about exploring Mars. I like this um, photograph of the, um, of the Mars. It was called the 2020 rover uh, before they had a contest and they named it Perseverance. And it turns out that the Perseverance name is particularly appropriate given the fact that this mission, essentially the, the, the really important part of it took place uh, during the epidemic. Uh, so uh, yeah, Perseverance was, was required on, it, on everybody's part to, to continue. But anyway, you get an idea, you see the text standing there next to it. You get an idea of the size of the Perseverance rover. It's kind of like a large uh, size uh, dune buggy or a small size uh, car. Uh, similar to Curiosity, um, the, the previous rover, but with a fair number of added gadgets and uh, different uh, capabilities than we saw before. But I like this photo because it, it's one that, that helps give us a scale. And when we look at the rover on Mars, it's sometimes difficult to tell the, the, you know, just what size a vehicle it is that we're talking about. And there's all kinds of equipment on here that I'll, I'll talk about later, at least some of, uh, that'll give you an idea of the kind of science that this thing is capable of. 
you can find lots of quick facts about uh, the Mars Perseverance rover or about the long-term um, Mars exploration at the NASA websites. I mentioned that the mission name was Mars 2020 uh, before the rover was called Perseverance. The main job, the main scientific job is to seek signs of alien life. This isn't this doesn't necessarily mean alien life like little green or gray men. Uh, this means perhaps microbial life. Um, the other thing it's going to do that's very interesting is to collect some ro rock and soil samples for later return to the Earth. Now, that mission isn't planned by us. The next likely mission would probably be the European Space Agency around 2025 or 2026 that might be able to go in and pick up these samples. But we're going we're gonna to try and hang on to those samples and collect them in little vials for, for gathering up in the future. It launched in uh, July of uh, last year uh, from Cape Canaveral here in Florida. As you can see, uh, just uh, recently landed a little bit less than a month ago. The landing site is a place called Jezero Crater, and we'll talk a little bit about Jezero Crater and, and why that's important. And uh, the duration of the mission is at least one Mars year, somewhere close to about two of our years. And besides the science, there's an interesting technology demonstration, something called the Mars helicopter. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the talk. So as usual, there's a, there's a couple of different ways we can talk about something like the, the rover. We could talk about the science it's going to do. And in fact, we'll, we will. We'll also talk about the kind of engineering that's necessary to, to make it, to get it there, to be able to have it do what it does. So um, this was, uh, I thought, an interesting page here about five fun engineering facts. Being an engineer by education, you, you probably could uh, guess that I, I might get a charge out of things like this. Um, showing off new wheels, I'll show you a photo of one of the reasons why the wheels have been upgraded since the Curiosity rover. Um, hearing, to the, hearing the sounds on Mars, yeah, pretty interesting. There's a microphone. If you want, you can go online. I don't have it embedded in this presentation, but you can hear the Martin, Martian wind. Uh, there's one experiment where they're firing a laser at a nearby rock sample to take off the surface and, uh, and aim another light at it to see if they can do chemical analysis. And you can hear uh, not like a science fiction movie laser sound, but like the click, click, click of the, uh, of the laser in the background to the Martian wind. I mentioned this idea of collecting some cool rock and sample, uh, rock and soil samples, or what's more properly called regolith, rather than soil samples for a future return, future collection. Then there's another technology demonstration, I've got a slide on this as well, about making oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. Well, how would you do that? Well, carbon dioxide has got a couple of, um, chemists would say moles, a couple of molecules of, of oxygen in it. And so there's a way we can, we can break up carbon dioxide and make oxygen. And this would have enormous potential importance for the future of being able to uh, send people to Mars and, and have them be able to live there and get them back safely, is if we could make some oxygen there that could be used either for breathing or for their rocket fuel for the return journey. Right. I love the, the original um, caption on this photo mentioned about the stone cold aluminum wheels. Um, and you can, you can see here, there's some arrows on the crack. Some of these um, uh, holes were deliberately sort of left like that. They, they left a, an impression uh, on, the, on the Martian surface. But there's other places where the aluminum wheels uh, clearly cracked and failed and, uh, and uh, rolling over the rocks. And you can imagine, uh, you know, something not too thick aluminum, they'd need to keep it light. But we're talking about 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So maybe not so um, unusual that, that the wheels would suffer some cracking as a result of rolling over rocks. So it's got a thicker, more robust uh, set of wheels. Okay, uh, let's go back a little bit and talk about what it takes to get something to Mars. Um, th this is um, what's known to scientists as something called the Holman transfer orbit. 
And so it's the way you can get something to another planet and use the minimum amount of fuel so that it's just going at the right speed when it gets there to be captured uh, by the, the local atmosphere. And you don't have to waste energy by braking as you get close to uh, as get close to the planet. So if we look here at the where we were at the position uh, between the Earth and Mars at the time of the launch, which was back in July, you could see we're pretty close. The what's known as opposition actually was uh, was a bit uh, before that. And part of what happens is that the Earth goes around the sun quicker. So we kind of you can see we could we speed ahead of where Mars is. So <clears throat> after the launch, um, Mars has moved this far in its orbit, and the Earth has gone that much further. So we're further away, significantly further away now from Mars than we were when the when the orbiter was launched. But this is exactly the right kind of timing that minimizes the need for all that fuel at the at the launch pad. And so this is how we get rockets there. And yeah, it takes six months, uh, but we got it there. And so all of that worked very well. So in fact, when I mentioned about being able to see Mars in the night sky, it's a lot smaller in the night sky now, it appears to us, than it did during the, uh, during the, during the summertime. Right. Uh, Jezero Crater. Where is Jezero Crater and why is it important? So what we, what we have here is like the Mercator projection of the Martian surface. So we've taken the sphere of Mars, we've kind of flattened it out into a rectangle. Uh, you can see here that it's called Mars uh, 2020. It's just on the dark, um, on the edge of a dark area known as Certus Major. Normally the dark areas represent the highland areas in Mars and the lighter colored areas represent the basins or lower elevation uh, regions of Mars. And it might not be surprising that, you know, we'd like to be not far from the, the places where there's a change because uh, it, it, it makes it more interesting terrain for us to cover. Hopefully we can land in a safe place, but then get close to the mountains or, or look at, at other features. Phoenix was maybe a little bit of a different um, uh, objective because the idea was to get close to the, the Martian pole for that landing. In any case, Perseverance here at the edge of, of Sardis Major, <clears throat> right at a place called Jezero Crater. Why land at Jezero Crater? What makes Jezero Crater so interesting? Well, from the geologist standpoint, there's only one thing that could have made these particular set of features, including this uh, wavy line here that comes down into what looks like a river delta. And that's that once there was flowing water on the planet. Now, whether that water may have been very, very salty or sludgy uh, or icy, we don't know, but certainly geologists don't have any other explanation for features like this other than the fact that there was once something uh, flowing water. Uh, the edge of this crater is this mountain range that, that you can see here in the, in the photographs. And so one of those things is, if you're gonna look for signs of life, you wanna look at where we thought that there was flowing water and in an area that might have looked like it was a former river delta, because if there was going to be microbial life somewhere, that would be the place to look for it. Okay, what's involved in landing there, and uh, how have we increased our understanding and our knowledge in order to be able to land in a region like this that might be close to some mountains, and it's a in more interesting place than a, a very flat plain? A couple of things that have changed here with regard to the orb orbiter. Um, one is that the parachute deployment isn't automatic any, anymore. They actually got to choose when the parachute deployed, which helps get the rover closer to where the ideal landing spot is. And the other thing is that when the um, orbiter is going to separate and it has to use retro rockets to slow down, <clears throat> that there's a navigation system that takes photographs of uh, the area underneath the rover and looks for a, a safe place to land and can help guide the rover then to a safe place. Um, all of this has got to be pre-programmed in 
and done on its own because you can't do it from Earth. It, it takes the speed of light is um, separates us by 11 minutes from Mars. So it would take 11 minutes for us to send a signal and another 11 minutes for us to get it back. So all of these things have to be pre-programmed into the computer, which is quite a feat. And hopefully if everything works out, I'll, I'll show you some of the pictures of, uh, if you haven't seen it before, of what this looks like. Um, uh, something called a sky crane maneuver uh, that lowers the rover to the ground and then the, the retro rocket booster kind of flies away and, and goes off in the other direction. Now, why do you have to use both the parachute and retro rockets? It's because that Martian atmosphere is so thin. So the parachute takes it down from uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 miles an hour, and it'll slow it down, but it'll only slow it down to about 200 miles an hour. Uh, so you still, we still need to have something else to slow it down so we can make a nice soft uh, touchdown. And I mentioned that photographic system. This is a little bit about how it works. Uh, the, the camera on the bottom of the lander uh, takes photograph of the terrain below, compares it to a map that's already built in, and then diverts, if necessary, the rover to a safe uh, place for it to land. And, and that's how we were able to, to land where we did, really in the sweet spot uh, there, very near uh, the, the delta there on Jezero Crater. So what, is that, um, what does that map look like um, that the... Um, uh, right, I'm sorry. So somebody um, asked a question and it was a, it was a good one. Let me go back, uh, let me go back a step couple of steps, right? So the back shell, someone asked about what happened to the back shell. The heat separation gets jettisoned before the active camera goes into place. So that back shell gets separated there um, so that this can operate. And then the top part flies away. And so I hope I, hope I, I answered that question. If I didn't, we can, uh, I'll try and get caught up with the questions at the end. So what does that picture look like that the uh, camera took and compared to the map inside the, uh, inside the rover? Well, it looked like this. The red areas are the unsafe areas and the blue areas are the safe areas to land. And so I hope you could see somewhere in the middle here, there's a little black circle. Uh, and so that's what the computer was seeing and saying, aha, we can land right in there safely. Uh, so really in the past, without these new navigational tools, without the ability to eject the parachute at a certain point, without this onboard navigation system, we would not have been able to land the rover in, in terrain like this. Okay, what does it look like a little closer? Um, here's where the rover is and the blue dot, and we're right here uh, in the sweet spot near where it looks like this ancient uh, river uh, delta was. Uh, that uh, flowing water came here, made a break in the edge of the crater. Uh, this is a very big crater. What we're seeing here is the, the mountains here on the left are the, the, a, a section of the walls of the crater. And we believe at one time this was a lake, uh, that it was a giant lake um, filled, with, uh, filled with water in the, in the distant past. And so, yeah, landed just about where we hoped it, it might be able to. Really, really good news there for the folks that worked on it. Right. Uh, what kinds of things are on this rover? Lots of really interesting scientific equipment. I guess you could say the robot, if we want to call the rover a robot, it's a robot that's like a cross between uh, an instrumental chemist and a geologist. And so the idea is for it to be able to look at rocks and look at soil and then, then do some analysis. Uh, that's kind of the, the short answer. Hopefully some of that analysis being able to, to lead to, to signs of potential life in the past. Again, I'll, I'll return to that in, in more detail. Um, Lots of imagers of one kind or another. Um, we can see here uh, something on the arm called Sherlock, an ultraviolet spectrometer. Uh, also, it's got something else on it called an X-ray spectrometer. And because of the word spectrometer or spectroscopy shows up a few times, I'll, I'll try and, and mention a little bit about those. It has a weather station on it. Again, shouldn't surprise us. Something called a super cam, which can zoom in really close. Uh, it's got a laser that can help 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, burn off the top layer and, and let us analyze what's beneath. Uh, got zoomable panoramic cameras. Altogether, there's 14 different cameras on the rover for different reasons. It's got um, a unit underneath called RIMFAX that looks down, uh, a subsurface radar to um, about 30 feet. So hopefully might be able to tell us if there is uh, liquid water or some unusual features underground. Um, underneath, I mentioned earlier, we'll come back to it, this uh, MOXIE unit producing oxygen from the, uh, from the Martian, Martian atmosphere. Right, <clears throat> I'll I won't talk about all of these, just talk about some of them. Mass Cam Z, again, uh, there's stereoscopic imaging capabilities, so we'll be able one day to look at the 3D images the way we've looked at some of the images from the Curiosity uh, rover. Um, from a scientific standpoint, it can do super zoom in close and pick out the best rocks and help us hunt for uh, signs of, uh, of life and, and signs of water. It has really, really sharper vision than any of the previous units. Uh, Supercam, again, uh, being able to look at things with the camera, this idea of spectrometers to do the chemical analysis and see what we can understand. Uh, it can do some of this without actually touching uh, the surface just by reading the light uh, coming back. Uh, hopefully it finds great, uh, uh, great rocks to look at and we can uh, look for things that uh, may have been indications of previous life. It's also going to measure the, the, the dust, uh, the, the chemical composition of the Martian dust. Uh, that, the Martian dust doesn't look like it's very happy stuff to have blowing around at, uh, astronauts or potentially blowing around where we would expect uh, astronauts to be dwelling. So uh, one of the things we need to understand better is the, the nature of, of Martian dust. And it'll measure the so-called air on Mars. Really, we, we know that's mostly carbon dioxide, but it's important to uh, measure what the, the actual components are. Right. So I've alluded to this a couple of times. It's a really important part of the mission, this idea looking for signs of life, probably signs of past life. Uh, Mars doesn't look like a very hospitable place for life uh, today. Um, I, I quote uh, a lady named Mary Stewart Johnson, who, who has a book out now, a fairly recent book on Mars. Uh, Mars was potentially habitable, uh, but there's still a big question of whether life took hold. Um, and if it did, um, could, could, could we find it? Uh, right? Is it, um, and, and could it still even be there? We know sometimes bacteria can live in very strange environments. And so one of the ideas here is to look at clays called smectites that could have a record of um, what are known as organic compounds. These, that doesn't mean they were grown without preservatives. In this case, it means that they contain carbon. And, and usually that's a sign of the kind of life as we understand uh, biological life. Um, necessary for life, life tends to be clumpy. And so if we were to find layers rich in organic compounds sandwiched in between layers that weren't, that would be a strong indication that there were life forms there once that created those layers. And then another a quote from uh, Professor Johnson at the end here, <clears throat> that even within the scientific community, there's huge debates about what qualifies as signs of life when we're looking at a, a rock record that is probably around 3.8 billion years. So it's been what we think, as near as the ge geologists can tell us, it's been about 3.8 billion years since there was flowing water on the surface of Mars. So yeah, we're looking at these signs of life. We're looking at this kind of crime scene investigation, if you want to compare it to a, a CSI style crime scene. But yeah, we're looking 3.8 billion years after the fact. So the reality is some of this evidence is not going to be completely um, uh, unequivocal. The, there'll be questions about it, what it means, whether or not it really is a big enough indication, and, and hence the need for understanding more and more uh, chemical analysis and how sophisticated these uh, components are. <clears throat> and one of the ways that we do this, and in fact, this is the way that we have come to understand what other stars have made of. You know, if you've read stories about stars other than the sun, even our own sun, 
what they're made of and, and, and how they differ in their composition. Well, how have we learned all of that? Well, we've learned it by analyzing the light from, from these stars. And we know that if we take a simple prism and we put sunlight through it, that the prism will break up the sunlight into a spectrum and we'll see a rainbow of types. In fact, the water droplets do the same thing uh, after the rain when the sunlight comes through them and breaks up the light into the different colors. And those are literally different wavelengths that we're seeing as different colors, right? The reds are the uh, longer wavelength, lower energy. Uh, the blues and the ultraviolets are the higher energy, shorter wavelengths. And so we can actually analyze that light and we can either run those different wavelengths through a sample or we can detect it directly and we could see, you know, what kind of light is coming, how it absorbs, and we can then understand a lot about the chemistry. And the reason the connection there is the fact that um, chemical elements have electrons spinning around the nucleus. And as those electrons change their energy levels and orbits, they either emit light or they absorb light. And so we're able to infer from what's going on with the light from distant objects, what's going on chemically with their electrons and therefore understanding something about their chemistry. So, you know, in the other thing that's useful to understand when we, when we talk about light is the fact that what we see as human beings is a very, very narrow band of what's known as the electromagnetic spectrum. We see with our eyes a very narrow band of wavelengths between, as I mentioned, kind of bordering on ultraviolet on the left here and the dark blues and sort of ending up near infrared on the right in the reds. <clears throat> but the reality is the electromagnetic spectrum exceeds and extends in both directions. So the higher energies, <clears throat> ultraviolet rays, those are the ones we can't see but we have to protect ourselves from, uh, particularly in the direct sunlight when you're in Key West. Uh, even more energetic and shorter wavelength are the X-rays, and then things like gamma waves, gamma rays, and cosmic rays from outer space with incredibly uh, high energy contents and very, very short wavelengths. At the other end of the spectrum, we go out towards the infrared. Uh, we come to thing like millimeter. We come to, uh, well, first of all, microwaves. Um, and radar, and then eventually even radio waves, big long wavelengths that pass through us without any notice, but with the right kind of equipment can, can help us get, uh, get signals. And so when we look at ways to analyze, we, we can't always understand what's going on with the molecules and that dance of electrons and how it relates to the light just by the visible light. Right. Uh, you know, we, we also want to understand, well, what's going on in the ultraviolet and what's going on in the infrared or in the X-ray. And both of those are important and, and can be very important to our understanding. We can't get all the chemistry we need from just looking at spectroscopy in the, in the visual range. So that's the reason for some of the, the different. You see the supercam did visible uh, light, the ultraviolet light by Sherlock and the X-ray, something called Pixel. All of those, the idea of better, getting us better chemical analysis, therefore a better uh, idea of whether or not there's biosignatures or, or signs of previous life. Another thing we're doing is to what's called caching samples, trying to uh, take the samples, put them into small tubes, and leave them behind undisturbed uh, for future pickup. And part of the reason we're doing this is that despite our best efforts at making the the, the rover as sterile as possible. The reality is that the rover in total will carry probably in the neighborhood of a half a million microorganisms on it. And so for instance, the tubes for the sample cache are the cleanest uh, products that have ever been produced uh, by the human race. And in fact, they were so clean that they presented a problem in testing because they seized up uh, in the testing apparatus uh, in what was known as the Excalibur incident where they, they, couldn't, they couldn't move the tubes around because they were so clean that even the slightest uh, film that, that would typically get on surfaces wasn't there. So despite our best efforts and despite our, our best abilities at sterility, the, 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 
the, the rover still carries a certain level of bio load. So we'd certainly love to be able to, to, to cache some samples, hopefully away from any contamination and save them. Because so, once we start landing there, you know, we'll, we'll bring our bio loads with us, of course, and it won't be so easy to tell uh, if we discover something, whether we brought it or it was there originally. Okay, I mentioned a couple of what's called technology demonstrations. So instead of the sort of science, understanding the evidence of water, evidence of, of life, chemistry, there's this idea of some technology demonstrations, one of which Moxie making uh, oxygen, O2, from CO2. Um, if you ever in school uh, ran electricity through water, you might have broken water, H2O, by electrolysis into hydrogen and oxygen. Same kind of idea here. Um, it looks a bit like a car battery and kind of acts like a car battery a little bit in reverse. So instead of getting the energy from the battery, we're actually putting the energy into it and, uh, and deliberately breaking the CO2 into carbon and, uh, and oxygen. And so the idea here is that we could use, uh, hopefully what will be produced is very pure oxygen, 99.6%. Uh, for either breathing or for fuel for future missions. This is just a demonstration unit. It's not going to make a huge amount, but you can imagine in the future, we could put a bunch of these units on the surface and have them make oxygen for future astronauts, either for breathing or for the, the, the return trip home. <clears throat> and then something that was originally supposed to have flied yesterday, so I had some hope of being able to show you some video. Got some delays, but Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter. Uh, again, just a technology demonstration. It's not designed to measure any kind of scientific parameters. It's just to see, can we do this? Um, and it's a small unit, it's about four pounds. It's got its own power, solar powered system and recharges on its own. Uh, that very top part we see here is its, its own little solar array. Really important when the temperature goes down so far, you know, 100 degrees below zero at night. It has counter rotating blades that need to spin very, very fast in order for this to work. And part of this reason is because the atmosphere there, what there is of it on Mars is so thin that really flying a helicopter is not a great idea, <laughs> generally speaking. Uh, you know, on Earth, for instance, the the elevation record for a helicopter on Earth is somewhere around 40,000 feet. So the idea of flying the equivalent of a helicopter at 100,000 feet is, is extraordinary because there's just not a lot of atmosphere there. There's not a lot of air there for those wings to beat and allow it. But nonetheless, they created this unit. They tested it in a vacuum or near vacuum environment on Earth at JPL. And um, they were able to get it to work in the test unit. And it's got computers on it. It's got navigation sensors. Uh, it's got a couple of cameras on it. It'll only go about a minute and a half at a time and up to maybe about uh, 160 feet worth of travel. You can't control it with a joystick for two reasons. The one I mentioned before is the long uh, round trip at the speed of light. It's 22 minutes round trip from here to Mars and back again for the signal. What I hadn't realized until I had watched one of the briefings is that even in the vacuum chamber, they originally tested this unit with experienced helicopter pilots. And the helicopter pilots couldn't control the unit with a joystick from outside the, the chamber. And what they figured out was um, the atmosphere is so thin and things happen so quickly that they can't be controlled by a human being in real time, even a helicopter pilot who's expert at it. And I guess the best analogy is if you think about the way things go on in air, and then you think about how much more slowly things go on underwater, it's almost like that analogy here. The kind of thick air that we're in right now allows for a slower level of, of activity than, than the very thin Martian atmosphere. Right, well, here's a little video of it doing the uh, slow motion test of its rotors sitting out there. This is actual video. This isn't a simulation. This was taken from the Perseverance rover unit. Um, but during the full rotation, full speed rotation spin, they discovered some issues and they're working on some software fixes now. They don't have a hard timetable. They're thinking maybe 
uh, next week if all goes right. They've got a number of different steps that they'll they'll have to do, uh, probably including testing a, um, a, a a a twin of this unit in that system there at JPL in a near Martian environment to make sure that the the software works there before they they attempt to upload it. But hopefully it'll fly. Um, yes to the uh, people who might ask, is it true that there's a little piece of the Wright Brothers airplane uh, on Ingenuity? The answer is yes, there is. Uh, they took a little piece of a fabric bit of the wing and taped it uh, in Ingenuity. So there is a direct uh, relationship there between Ingenuity and the uh, the Wright Brothers airplane from, from Kitty Hawk. So a little bit of Kitty Hawk will, will fly uh, first powered flight, hopefully from another planet. Um, a great, uh, great achievement of mankind in a in a hundred years or so. So stay tuned for that. Uh, hopefully, uh, some good news in uh, in the next week or so on the helicopter. Okay, I've got to do a little bit of fooling around here to get this video to play, but I've got a three and a half minute video, which is kind of an interesting thing to see, and I wanted to be able to. Um, share that with you. Let's see if I can get that to work again. So if I share screen, um, okay. Now this did work for the demo. Um, Michael, if you or somebody could chat to me and let me know, are you uh, are you seeing my screen with uh, says Perseverance Rovers Descent and Touchdown? Yeah, we are seeing that. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. That uh, that parachute was shot out by a mortar at 100 miles an hour, so they could deploy in time to uh, slow it down in the thin atmosphere. Hopefully you could see the little cartoon at the bottom with the what's going on with the spacecraft there, the little simulator showing the parachute and the heat shield separated. We're looking at the Martian surface now.
they're going to switch cameras soon and you'll see uh, the view from the lander itself. Right, so that's dust blowing off the surface from the rockets of the uh, retro uh, unit. So we're looking at the rover being descended on the left here from the, the uh, sky crane. Okay, let me stop sharing. Let me go back to my screen, hopefully. Michael, can you confirm, are we back on uh, PowerPoint? You are, yes. Okay, thank you. Right, so here's one of the early photographs that were taken. Uh, the mountain range you can see there at the, uh, at the edge, that's the actual mountains around the, the edge of the Jezero Crater. And uh, I'll, I'll end there before opening it up for questions if there's some time. And uh, again, uh, thanks again to Michael Nelson and the Key West Library. And uh, thank, thanks to all of you for being interested in the future exploration of Mars and hopefully a better understanding of the universe that we live in. Michael, do you want to, you have any uh, people chatting through any questions or you want to ask for any questions? We have some time. Um, I don't see anything coming through on the chat and you did talk about the, I got an email, um, but I think you covered it about the delayed helicopter, Jenny. Yeah, ingenuity, right. So the what what happened was that uh, the the helicopter uh, on last Friday night did not perform well on the full speed uh, test of the rotors, and something went wrong. And they think it's a it can be fixed with a software issue, and so that's what's led to the delay and the the reason that the helicopter didn't fly yesterday. Uh, they're hoping it'll fly next week. Um, but but that was the reason it 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 did okay on the slow speed test of the rotors, but something something timed out. They got a timeout warning when they they tried to do the full speed uh, rotor test for the helicopter. Okay, and there's a. Do you see the question about the European mission? No, I haven't. Let me open up the chat. So hopefully I can. Oh no, I've got. I've just got one on the. Um, it says you mentioned upcoming European mission to collect samples. What are other upcoming missions? What challenges must be overcome? Yeah, the uh, so that the, I mentioned, I made reference to the sample caching and the fact that NASA does not have a planned mission yet to to get those samples back. Um, that the the next mission that would likely be able to do that would be the uh, European Space Agency, also known as the ESA mission that would take place circa 2025, uh, 2026, so maybe about five years from now. In, and it's a complicated procedure to get the samples back. So the first thing that would have to happen, first thing, let's just take the, the, the story from the samples. You got to have a rover to collect those samples. Then you've got to have a vehicle that's going to take off from the Martian surface and meet up with something in orbit around Mars. 
and then something in orbit around Mars that would then separate out and make the trip back to Earth. So it really is quite a complicated sequence, far more complicated than even what we've been able to achieve so far to be able to get those samples back to, uh, back to Earth. Um, you know, in some ways, it's, you may have read or heard about getting samples back from asteroids. Well, at least with the asteroid, you don't have much gravity to fight when you separate back off the asteroid. You know, in this case, you've got, okay, it's not Earth gravity, but it's about a third of Earth's gravity on the surface of Mars. So you need a good rocket to take it off. You need to somehow then, that's not, that rocket isn't going to take it all the way back to Earth. You need to rendezvous with an orbiter, one that can separate out and, and has a rocket that could then get back to Earth. So complicated scenario, lots of challenges. Maybe it doesn't happen in 2025, 2026. Maybe it happens later than that. And uh, there's a question here, will the carbon ultimately contaminate MOXIE and reduce its efficiency? Um, so what happens with units like this is that um, what usually contaminates it is the, what happens is that the catalyst that's used for the electrolysis um, is almost like a maybe a filament in a in a light bulb. It's it's the catalyst that gets poisoned by these little uh, impurities that that will probably give out uh, and stop the moxie unit from working. Uh, but it, it'll be an important demonstration. I think it's it's due to produce somewhere in the neighborhood of like a liter of, if I recall, of liquid oxygen. So I mean, it's a, a reasonable amount. Uh, but certainly not a, an amount that's going to do a, a future mission justice. We, we would have to build some significantly bigger units and have more of them to have a usable amount. All right. Well, uh, it looks like we're about to hit the hour. So I wanted to thank you so much and, and thank all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, take care and have a good day. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye now.